Hello everyone, I'm Chris Goodwin with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. Welcome to this week's History's Lunch Program, which is sponsored by the John and Lucy Shackle for Charitable Fund of the Community Foundation for Mississippi. We're in our home, the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium in the Museum of Mississippi History and Mississippi Civil Rights Museum, and we're streaming live on both Facebook and YouTube. If you've not already done so, please silence your cell phones. And if you haven't yet been through the fabulous World of Marty Stewart exhibit upstairs, an excellent opportunity to do so for free will be on Thursday, August the 4th at 11 a.m. when Dan Barnard will give a gallery talk. Barnard is executive director of Marty Stewart's Congress of Country Music, which is going to open soon in Philadelphia, Mississippi. We're all excited about that. And of course, just down from the Marty Stewart exhibit is the new Green Book exhibit, Next week's History is Lunch will feature its curator, the award-winning photographer and cultural documentarian Candace Taylor, author of the book Overground Railroad, The Green Book and the Roots of Black Travel in America. So please come for that. Today, we're delighted to welcome back our old friend Andrew Haley to present Grave Concerns, Cooking and Conservation in the Mississippi Delta. Andrew P. Haley is an Associate Professor of American History at the University of Southern Mississippi. He earned his BA in History from Tufts University and his MA and PhD, both in American History, from the University of Pittsburgh. Haley's first book, Turning the Tables, American Restaurant Culture and the Rise of the Middle Class, 1880 to 1920, won the 2012 James Beard Award for Scholarship and Reference. He also gave a fabulous History's Lunch program on that book, no pressure. Help me welcome Andrew Haley. Thank you all for coming out today. I am uh, immensely jealous of all of you because you live nearby and can attend these events regularly. I try to attend them online. Um, it's just a fantastic seri series. It's, uh, I'm immensely appreciative of everything that MDAH does, and I'm immensely appreciative of the museums here, which I think are really adding um, to Mississippi and our appreciation of Mississippi's history. Today I have a, a bit of a challenge in front of me. Um, I want to talk to you about cookbooks and why cookbooks matter and why we should collect them um, and study them. Um, and in order to do that, I'm going to talk about a graveyard. Um, and in order to make that graveyard meaningful, I'm going to have to talk about conservation. Um, so this is a very winding talk. Um, and hopefully by the end, I've managed to pull together um, cooking graveyards and conservation. Um, but before I do any of that, I want to talk about myself a little bit um, and tell you how come I'm here and how this all started. Um, and it really starts, you know, growing up. Um, I had a Lebanese-American mother um, who loved to cook, cook and was a renowned cook um, and had two sons and insisted that her two sons should um, enjoy cooking as well. Um, and so my brother there in the background um, and me, we both learned how to cook. Um, and I went to college and I met a woman um, who would go on to become a uh, professional chef. Um, and so cooking and the culinary world was always in my life. And I went to graduate school, um, and I was searching around for a way to study the middle class and middle class formation. And restaurants and cooking seemed like an obvious way to do it. So I wrote a dissertation, um, which became a book called Turning the Tables. Um, and it was about New York City, primarily, but about Chicago and San Francisco and Atlanta and a little bit in there on New Orleans. Um, but it was about big urban centers. And then I came to Mississippi to teach. Um, and I could not quite figure out how to translate the work I was doing to a state that was much more rural. Um, and despite that, I was asked to give a talk, a talk about Mississippians and Mississippi food, because I was a food historian, of course. Um, and so I did what historians do. I went to the archives, um, first to the Southern Miss archives. Um, and it was in those archives that I first looked seriously at community cookbooks. Community cookbooks are those cookbooks that are put together, usually almost always as fundraisers by civic organizations and churches and women's groups to raise money. Um, and they're fascinating because they're put together by a collectivity, right? They have recipes from within the community. And almost immediately, I fell in love 
Almost immediately, I realized that this was going to be a very difficult relationship because these cookbooks don't really tell you much about why they were written and the people who wrote them. Um, but I thought if I could understand these within the context of the communities in which they were written, they could tell an interesting story and help me to understand Mississippi food. Um, so after looking at the ones at Southern Miss, I traveled the state. I went to MDAH, I went to um, the University of Mississippi and Mississippi State and Delta State, looking at what they had for cookbooks. And, and I found a few here and a few there, um, but there was nothing like a comprehensive collection. I imagined there were more. I imagined there were probably about 100 cookbooks, community cookbooks, that had been written before uh, 1970. Um, as it turned out, I was, I was way off. There's been, we've located at least 200, a little over 200, and there's probably even more. Um, but I thought there were, must be 100, and I had probably seen about 20 or 30 of these. Um, so I partnered with the University of Southern Mississippi's archives, and in particular, the, Missy, uh, the curator of, Missy, uh, of the uh, Mississippiana collection, Jennifer Brannock, um, and together we started looking for these. Um, and we were helped out with some large donations, um, and um, we purchased some, and we tracked some down in yard sales, and ultimately, today, we have a culinary collection that consists of about 8,000 cookbooks, manuscripts, papers, menus, and other culinary works. Um, some of those, um, most of those, are about Mississippi. Some are about Louisiana and Tennessee and Alabama, our kind of regional um, uh, uh, culinary partners. Um, some are famous cookbooks, American cookbooks, or international cookbooks. Um, but the heart of the collection remains the community cookbooks. Um, and today, we have thousands of community cookbooks. And in the historic collection, those published before 1970, we have over 200 historic community cookbooks. Um, and through some grants and some magic, um, we've managed to put over 100 of them online. Um, so you can go home tonight and, and look at these community cookbooks if you want to, or at least a goodly portion of them. Um, so that collection has become the basis of my work. And Today, I want to justify um, our collecting those cookbooks and my working on those cookbooks by talking about one cookbook that illustrates the value of looking at community cookbooks as a historical resource. Um, so I think community cookbooks can tell us a lot of things. Um, some cookbooks, the, the, the story they tell us is about the people who wrote that cookbook. Um, so I've looked at very closely at Calhoun City, um, in Mississippi. It's kind of in the central northern part of the state. Um, and in particular, by looking at this cookbook that was published in 1961 for the high school, I've been able to talk about a transformation in that community. Um, a transformation from a community where uh, it was a uh, community of lumbermen and furniture makers. Um, but in the 1940s, a pants factory, clothing, pants, um, showed up. Um, and it really changed the community to a community where men, where men had worked, to a community now where many of the major bread earners, breadwinners, were women. And you see that reflected in a cookbook that has a lot more convenience foods in it. Um, in Laurel, Mississippi, I've been able to talk about Laurel and who lived in Laurel at the turn of the century by looking at a very famous cookbook, the Laurel Cookbook that was published. It's one of the earliest cookbooks published in Mississippi in 1900. Um, that's a cookbook that was largely spearheaded um, by Catherine Gardner, who was the spouse of the owner of the giant lumber mill that turned Laurel from a little kind of backward uh, 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 lumber camp into a city. Um, and in this cookbook, Book. She includes recipes from her family, who are from the North, the Midwest, um, but she also includes recipes from workers at the factory, um, mostly white, some African American, people who had come from the Carolinas, from Alabama, from Louisiana, all to work there. And I argue that this community, this, this cookbook, helps to create the community of Laurel that the gardeners wanted, an inclusive community that they were trying to create at that time. 
And sometimes, though, the cookbook is less about the recipes and more about why it was published. Um, remember, these are charity cookbooks. They're fundraisers. Um, and in fact, from the very beginning, these cookbooks were about raising money. What is usually seen as the first community cookbook, the first charity cookbook in the United States, in fact, in the world, because we invented the form, was written by Maria Moss um, after the Civil War. Um, and she was part of an effort in the North to help return turning soldiers, and they, had, they held what they called sanitation fairs. Um, and she took the food that was prepared at one of these sanitation fairs and turned it into a cookbook called the Poetical Cookbook, um, uh, published in 1864. Um, and it was really the first, and it was intended to raise money for those returning soldiers. Well, the cookbook I'm talking about today is in that vein. It is a cookbook that was published in Chula, Mississippi, in the Mississippi Delta. Um, it was published by the local garden club. Um, it was published in 1958, and it was a fundraiser. And how do I, all, if, all of these are fundraisers, but what attracted me to this cookbook right from the beginning was a tiny little note on something like page five um, at the bottom of the page, and for some reason, this is, whoops, it's not actually displaying my little note here. Um, but what is said is that, and I, don't, I have no idea why, um, but it, it, what is said is that the cookbook was being published to raise funds for the Pinecrest Cemetery. Um, and this was rare. Even though these, were, these cookbooks are fundraisers, they don't usually tell you what it is they're raising the money for. And so I was fascinated by this. Why a cemetery? Um, why was the Garden Club involved in this project? Um, and so this is what I'm going to do today. Um, I'm going to try and convince you that community cookbooks are these amazing historical resources um, by looking at um, the Pinecrest Cemetery and the cookbook that was created to raise funds for it. Um, and to do that, I want to introduce you to a couple. Um, um, their names are Hugh and Curl Nichols. Um, because Hugh and Curl Nichols, who lived in Chula and participated in this cookbook, really encompass um, the whole story that I'm telling. And their lives really um, help us to see how men and women viewed their responsibility to the Delta and its environment, to conservation, very differently. Um, so I'm not an expert on all of these things. I start as a food expert, but then I have to talk about graveyards, and I have to talk about fundraising, and I have to talk about um, ecology and, and conservation, and so just bear with me, um, and I'll answer any questions at the end. So. Um, so we're going to start with the Nichols family. Um, and the Nichols family lived on, um, and members of the Nichols family, as far as I know, still own, the Lynchfield Plantation. The Lynchfield Plantation had been around since the early 19th century, um, but the Nichols family seems to have acquired it in the early 20th century. Um, Hugh Nichols Sr., um, purchased the land, but he never lived on the land. He lived in Lexington, Mississippi, and he was kind of an absentee landowner who had um, a hired hand running the establishment. Um, and he had, and, and this Lynchfield plantation, it was located just north of Chula proper um, in an incredibly rich area of the Mississippi Delta. Um, some people have referred to this as Mississippi's Garden of Eden. Um, it's an area of oxbow lakes um, that have extraordinarily rich soil that produces bountiful uh, uh, crops. And so this particular plantation is hard to see, but it is in the middle of Horseshoe Lake, uh, an oxbow um, uh, where the river, where the Yazoo River has been cut off to form this kind of lake. And in the, the dead middle of that lake is the plantation itself. Um, and um, that brings us to Hugh Jr. Um, so Hugh Jr. 
Um, grew up in Lexington, and that's where he met Ann Troll. And Ann Troll, um, and he, they fell in love. They dated for 13 years. Um, while they were dating, he went off to Millsap College, got a degree, was a member of the band, was a member of a sorority. Um, he came back to Lexington, and then he moved with his new wife, Ann, who went by the name Curl, um, uh, to the plantation. Um, and they built a, 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 a modest by plantation standards, but a, a nice house there right on the plantation so that he could run the cotton plantation. Um, the land was still owned by his father, um, but he uh, uh, rented the flat land that they owned, um, and his brother, Thomas Beale, rented the land that was in the hills um, on the edge of Chula, and uh, Hugh raised cotton and Thomas raised cattle. Um, and so they divided up the land. Um, all of that was interrupted by World War II. Um, uh, Hugh Nichols um, would become a pilot in World War II. He was attached to the 172nd Artillery Division where he was a reconnaissance pilot, um, participated in D-Day, was promoted um, uh, during the war, but he came back um, um, the couple had had one child before the, he left for a war, and they had a second child, a second son, um, after he returned. And they made their home here on the Lynchfield Plantation. Um, so this is Hugh um, in this picture, and over here is Curl uh, Nichols. Um, and their story helps us to understand ecology and the graveyard because both of them, in 1960, would win incredibly prestigious awards for their conservation of the land, basically. Um, Hugh would win an award for being an efficient farmer, and Curl won an award as part of the Garden Club for preserving a piece of land. Um, and I think their stories will help us to see some differences in gender and an understanding of how the land should be used. Um, so this is their, their, their sons. I have a million slides and sometimes I get ahead of myself, what can I say? Yeah. But I want to talk a little bit about Hugh and Hugh's award um, to begin. So um, Hugh is a farmer, um, he's growing cotton. Um, and he's growing cotton on the Lynchfield plantation in the post-World War II period, right? Um, and that's a very specific period in, in, in agriculture because the New Deal has really changed the way agriculture is done in the United States. Um, as part of the New Deal, there's the passage of the Agricultural Adjustment Act. The first version of that is thrown out by the courts, but it's rewritten as a conservation law to preserve land, and that is found constitutionally sound. And it begins the building of a whole series of programs, the Soil Bank, we could talk about them endlessly, programs by the federal government to get farmers involved in taking better care of their land. Um, the basic idea is that the, the great depression and the dust bowl conditions had been, been caused by land erosion and that farmers needed to use their land less intensively. Um, so they needed to rotate crops on a regular basis. They needed to create um, uh, drainage dish ditches and put up um, stands of trees to help the wind from blowing off the topsoil. Um, and all of this, the federal government was getting involved in, in setting standards, in educating the farmers about this, and often paying for it. Um, in the late 1950s, um, about 22% of Holmes County farmers, that 22% owned 45% of the land in Holmes County, the agricultural land in Holmes County. About 22% of the farmers participated in federal soil erosion programs um, to protect the soil, and they were paid significant amounts of money. $100,000 in federal funds helped to buoy and keep up the farm economy in Holmes County by this active engagement in some form of conservation. And for Hugh, um, his 
contact for doing this was his county farm agent, a man by the name of W.R. Sullivan. Uh, and Sullivan was considered one of the finest uh, farm agents in Mississippi. He was um, uh, trained by the federal government, paid for by the state government, paid for by the county um, as well, to help provide farmers like Hugh, who wanted to be modern and sophisticated, with the newest information available on how to care for their land. And this led Hugh, who's over here, this is Hugh, um, um, this is their land manager, uh, J.A. Holly, who was with them for years. This is Hugh's father, who actually owned the land. And on the far right over there is uh, W.R. Sullivan. Um, and, and so Hugh, who wanted to be a modern farmer, um, who was interested in modern fam farming, implement, implements skip row planting. Um, now again, I'm not an expert on agriculture. I can barely plant a, a, a tomato garden. Um, in fact, in the South, I have had no success planting a uh, tomato garden. Um, but I'll do my best here. What skip row planting is, and it's still something that farmers debate today, is that you plant some rows and you leave some low, rows uh, empty. Right? In, in Hugh's case, he planted, he, this is plowed so you can barely see it, but he planted four rows of cotton and then left four rows empty. And the idea was that with um, intensive use of what he called chemicals, um, which were pesticides and fertilizers, um, uh, you could get as much out of this intermediate um, planting, uh, because it, the cotton plants were, had more access to the sun and were easier to tend, you could get as much as you could out of just planting the entire field. Um, and in fact, in 1958 and 59, he had record crops. Um, now, I don't want to take anything away from Hugh, but I have to tell you when I was doing the historical research, I discovered that Litchfield was just a magical plantation. It had had record crops before um, uh, skip row planting. But Hugh had a fantastic harvest that came to the attention through that, that county agent to the state um, agency, and he won a state award um, um, for his planting, for this unprecedented yield he had. And that got the attention of the Ford Motor Company. Yeah, you didn't think I was going to go there. That got the attention of the Ford Motor Company because Ford produced tractors and other farm implements, um, and they were really interested in what farmers were doing, and they produced a magazine for farmers, and they produced an almanac, the Ford Almanac. And in 1960, they decided to award the 12 most efficient farmers in America with their first ever Farm Efficiency Award. Um, and they decided to give that award um, to uh, different farmers who grew uh, particular crops. Uh, and in Mississippi, this is Mississippi over here, it was cotton. And the farmer, the most efficient farmer for cotton was Hugh Nichols. Um, so he is identified by the Ford Motor Company in 1960 as one of the 12 most efficient farmers in America. And that was a big deal because this is the Ford Motor Company. He is invited up to Dearborn, Michigan. There is a massive banquet where the 12 farmers are honored. Henry Ford II gives him his plaque in person. Um, the Undersecretary of Agriculture, True Morse, is there to congratulate him. And the next day, he will meet with the Vice President of the United States, Richard Nixon, to talk about agriculture and agricultural policy. And on top of all of that, Henry Ford II announces a surprise. He has been working with the State Department, and Ford Motor Company will pay for these 12 efficient farmers to go on a world tour, global tour, to promote American efficient farming. And by efficient, they mean both economic, but also environmentally intelligent farming uh, around the world. Um, this is, he's, um, uh, Henry Ford has worked with the State Department. This is seen as an anti-communist effort, right? Convinced people in South America and in Asia that they can farm capitalists, do capitalist farming without hurting their environment and bring in enough profits that they don't have to turn to land reform in the communists. Um, so it's an anti-red policy. Um, and Hugh 
takes them up on this offer. Um, and in 1960, the summer of 1960, he is sent around the world. Um, he is on the Asian wing of the tour with, with five other farmers, um, and they go to Turkey, and they go to Pakistan, and they go to India, and they go to Thailand, and they go to Taiwan, and they go to Japan, all to promote American agriculture. And it's a very big deal. Um, Mississippi newspapers, the central newspapers here in Jackson, the newspapers in the Delta all cover this. The national newspapers um, talk about this and talk about Hugh and, and, and what these farmers are doing. So a very big deal. <laughs> Meanwhile, back home, um, Curl is involved in a different project. Um, so Curl is a member of the Garden Club. Um, and she's very serious about it. In 1958, she is the secretary of the Garden Club. Um, now, I have to tell you, Holmes County, boy, do they love clubs in Holmes County. Um, and Chula, although a very small town, um, has dozens of clubs. Um, um, but Curl was particularly committed to the Garden Club, um, as were most of the wives of wealthy planters. There were about 200 white women living in Chula in the late 1950s, and about a quarter of them are members of the Garden Club. Um, it is a big deal. Um, it is for wealthy women, um, the wives of merchants, but the wives of planters. Um, many years later, I, I talked to somebody who had been a member of the Garden Club in the 80s, and she remembered these older women, and she said they all came to their tea parties uh, to talk about gardening, and they were all wearing, you know, floor-length mink coats. Um, that was the garden party. Um, uh, that, that was the Garden Club in, in Chula, Mississippi. Um, but... I don't want to dismiss these women um, because they are very serious in making Chula a nicer place to live. Um, after World War II, they had created a monument um, in honor of the World War II veterans and other veterans from Chula. Um, it is not in perfect condition these days, but it's a, uh, it, it's a fountain. Um, it was a fountain, um, and it was dedicated in 1949 and erected by the Garden Club. And after they finished that project, they looked around for another major project, and they started working on building a cemetery. Um, Chula didn't have a cemetery. Um, one, one guy who grew up in Chula during this time said that um, the worst thing about dying was that on his way to hell, he would have to go to Lexington, Mississippi. Because <laughs> Chula, Chula didn't love Lexington. Um, and so they wanted their own cemetery, a whites-only cemetery, um, um, a, a, a white cemetery for Mississippi, um, uh, or for Chula. And in order to do that, um, they raised funds. They held garden shows. They sold plants. But the big fundraising effort was a 1958 cookbook, the subject of this talk, called just Cookbook by the Chula Garden Club. And as you can see, um, this is the, the members of the club and who they were. And you can see H.L. Uh, Nichols Jr. was the secretary of the Garden Club. And you can see that um, uh, she was also on the, publish, um, on the advertising committee. And that was probably appropriate. Um, um, we'll talk about that in just a second. But before I do that, I have to say something about this cookbook. This is a talk about a cookbook that's not going to talk about food very much. I'm sorry about that, and I'm happy to answer questions about food. Um, but it's not really about the food. But this is my single page from that cookbook. And in fact, this is my single page in any community cookbook I have looked at from Mississippi. Um, because it encompasses what Mississippi cooking was in the mid 20th century so well. At the top is a recipe for squirrel stew. The next recipe is for chopped suey. And the final recipe is the weirdest recipe of all. Um, it is by a Middle Eastern American woman um, who is giving a recipe for stuffed cabbage, but to translate stuffed cabbage to her Delta um, uh, friends, she calls them cabbage tamales. Um, it is just an amazing page. And the cookbook itself is wonderful. It has hints of the fact that many of the recipes were actually prepared by black servants at home. Um, there is one 
and this is offensive to us today, but in, in, in terms of that period, it actually gives more credit than most. Um, one recipe that's credited to Mrs. Jones Cook, um, and that was a rare reference to the fact that there were black servants behind many of these recipes. So, as much as I think Curl contributed to this, Curl Nichols, I don't think, was a great cook or an amazing cook. Um, um, in an interview she gave in 1958, it references the fact that she cooked um, and was a good cook. But the honest truth is she had a black woman who came in and did most of the cooking. And when we look at the recipes she contributed, there were only three, which is remarkable since she was part of this big project to put together this cookbook. And they're all rather simple. I'm afraid some of them got cut off here. But there's um, uh, this one here is a, a prune whip, yes. This is a, a prune whip at the top. Um, it's a relatively simple recipe. Uh, I think, oops, somehow... I'm, I'm off here. This is slide is off. But this one here, uh, date loaf candy, um, uh, will tell you a lot about it. Um, uh, it is a very simple four-ingredient recipe, and the other two recipes that she submitted were, were, were equally simple. Um, so I don't think her big contribution was that she was a great cook, in other words. Um, her big contribution was that she was on the advertising committee, um, and that mattered. Um, because community cookbooks at this point in time, they cost a lot to print. Um, printing costs would go down later, and now there's lots of community cookbooks because they're cheap to print. Um, but in the 1950s, it cost a lot. And so in order to do a community cookbook, you first sold advertisements to raise the money to pay for the printing of the community cookbook, and then you sold the community cookbook in order to make profits that went to your charitable efforts. And if you didn't have the advertisements, the whole thing didn't and get off the ground. And uh, Curl was part of that advertising committee. And as the wife of a very prosperous farmer, um, as the mother of two children who were school age, she had tons of connections in that community um, and helped to put together the cookbook through her advertising. And that cookbook was to create this cemetery, the Pinecrest Cemetery. But Pinecrest Cemetery, as, as this sign, which was put up later, suggests, was more than a cemetery. Um, I'm not entirely about, sure about the wildflower garden. It appeared in the 1970s, and I, I don't know anything about it. Um, but the um, arboretum was part of the plan right from the beginning. The cemetery is located on a lowest bluff that overlooks the town of Chula, um, and it consists of 35 acres. 15 acres were dedicated to the cemetery proper and were planted with 2,000 pine trees, as well as a few other, um, you know, a, 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 a walkway that entered in signage so that you knew there was a cemetery there. Um, and the rest, the 20 remaining acres, were planted, according to contemporary records, with 16,000 trees. Um, and it was, throughout the trees were pathways um, and walkways and uh, bridges that have not survived so well. Um, it was to be a nature preserve. Um, so what we're seeing here is an alternative not in competition necessarily, but an alternative to the kind of ecology and conservation that her husband was involved in, right? For Curl Nichols and members of the Garden Club, conservation, conservation meant planting trees and preserving land, right? Not turning it into something that was economic, but something that was recreational, um, that would attract birds, that would preserve some of the natural environment. Um, and this, in fact, had been part of what garden clubs in America had been doing since at least the 1920s. Now, this is a story that we should know a lot more about. Um, as far as I know, there's only one historian who has written about this, a woman by the name of Shana Cohen. Um, and Shana Cohen argues that since the 1920s, the garden clubs had been very actively engaged in and participating in and promoting an idea of conservation. 
Yes, garden clubs were about sociability and they were about tea parties. Um, and yes, they were about, and this is what they were most known about, for beautification campaigns. Particularly in the 1950s, they were very involved in highway beautification. But behind all that was a concerted and consistent effort to preserve the natural environment. In Mississippi, that really took off in the 1930s when the um, president of the state garden club, J.D. Duncan, made conservation a statewide agenda. And I think that's where the women in Chula kind of picked up that thread. By the time the late 1950s that they actually were able to build the cemetery, they had gone out a little bit out of style in Mississippi. The president of the garden club in Mississippi was more into beautification by then. But the the Chuler women were steadfast and dedicated in creating a space that was not only practical, a cemetery, but was also preservationist um, um, and the preservation of land. And yet, unlike Hugh, who became a celebrity for his efficient farming, the women of Chula had a hard time getting noticed, to be honest. Um, so the first reference to their award takes place in the in and about Chula column in the Holmes County Herald. Um, now, this is not a big deal. This is the same column that you know, tells you when the, the baseball team is playing, right? Um, the local uh, high school baseball team is playing. It just has little facts about what's going on and had regularly reported on the comings and goings of the Garden Society. It talks about the fact they've won this giant award, but it's, you know, it's on page four in a, in, a, in a column about Chula. Most people wouldn't even have noticed. They eventually get some mention um, in the state paper, in the Clarion Ledger, but it is in an article that's talking about Mrs. Lester Brown. Um, and Mrs. Lester Brown, she probably was a lovely woman, I don't know her, um, but she was head of the Garden Society, um, um, the Garden Clubs of America in Mississippi. She was running for office for our second term in that position. She was very much into beautification. Um, she happened to have received, um, I haven't talked about the award yet. I got ahead of myself, didn't I? Um, she happened to receive this award that I'm going to tell you about in just a second um, when she was at the um, National um, Garden Club meeting, but she had had nothing to do with what was going on in Chula. So what I skipped ahead and forgot to tell you about was that the garden, the, the, the cemetery, Pinecrest, wins an award. Um, just like the men um, had, uh, Hugh has won an award, it wins a national award and frankly, probably an even more prestigious award. Um, this award is given by the Garden Clubs of America every year, had been since the 1920s. It's called the Kellogg Civic Achievement Award. Um, only one is given every year and it's only given if there's a worthy contender. Um, and it's given for a project that truly improves both the lives of the community and the environment and the, 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 the life of that community. And so the women of Chula, um, they had first won a state award, um, then they won, I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself here, they won this national, very prestigious national award, and yet that is mentioned only in passing um, in the local, their local newspaper, the uh, Holmes County Herald. Um, it's eventually mentioned only in passing in the Guardian um, and the Clarion Ledger. Um, and you can tell that this frustrated the women because about a month after the award was given, this article appeared again in the Holmes County Herald. Um, and it is, I believe, written by a member of the Garden Club. Um, and see if you agree with me. What it basically says is, hey, you've ignored us and we need to let you know we won this award. What it says is the medal is on display at the Merchants and Planters Bank because there was an actual medal that went around with this award. And remember as you view this medal that your town, Chula, has received the very highest award given by the National Council of Garden Clubs, Inc. in 48 states and three foreign countries. This award isn't given every year unless some club merits the honor. It really feels to me like the club is saying, hey, why are you ignoring us? Um, here is this award. Go look at it. This is a big deal. And they were right. It was a huge deal. Um, I would argue that one of the reasons that it's ignored is because they were women. Um, because their version of conservation um, um, was not as flashy 
um, and as celebrated in the 1950s as Hugh's version was, right? Hugh, when he wins this brand new award that's given to 12 people, gets all sorts of attention, meets with the vice president, is quoted by the wire services, UPI, on his views about communism because he had won this award, um, is invited to speak at the garden club. No, no. Um, um, but the women, their award just kind of passes into history. Um, now, that didn't discourage these women in Chula. Um, they maintain that cemetery and that park they've created for years. In 1978, they reissue their cookbook um, in order to provide additional funds for the upkeep and to get the Boy Scouts in there to redo those trails, which unfortunately now have, have declined once again. Um, but they have a lifelong commitment to this idea of preserving the land. Um, but the men in town don't always share this. I'll tell you a story. Um, in the 1970s, the Chula Garden Club wants to get Purple Martins to, uh, um, um, uh, to, 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 to live, the birds, the purple martins, to live in Chula. Um, and they have an effort to put up birdhouses um, throughout town. Uh, and that makes a lot of sense for the garden club for ecological reasons. Pur purple martins eat mosquitoes. And so we will keep down the mosquito population in Chula without using pesticides and chemicals. Um, and they think this is a mar marvelous effort. Um, well, one member of the garden club, uh, George Martin, she goes to her son and she says, son, I need some help. Can you help me to put up this, this birdhouse for Purple Martin so that we can keep the mosquitoes down? And his response, which is laughed about all over town, uh, his response is, well, if the Purple Martins eat all of the skeeters in this town, uh, we'll be knee deep in bird shit. Um, so men in the town never quite understood what the women were doing with their idea of ecology. Um, that difference, I think, is immensely telling. Um, and I think it also um, points to a struggle that Chula would have in the 1960s and 1970s. By the 1960s, there's some evidence in Chula that the cotton economy is not going to keep this town running. Um, there's just not enough money. Many of the cotton farmers and planters don't live there anymore. The town is facing some decline. And the Area Development Project issues a report in 1966 that celebrates farming, but in the margin says, we need something else, and perhaps tourism and parks would be a good idea. It says Chula has no parks because the Area Development uh, partnership in Holmes County hasn't even paid enough attention to realize the women have built a park in town and are maintaining a park in town. Um, they, the, the county knows they need to do something more, but even though it's, it's right there in front of them, they don't know how to do it and they don't make changes. Um, the changes eventually come, and I'll talk about that in a moment. But I want to go back to Curl and Hugh just for a second. Um, and this is really an aside, so I'll make this quick. But their, life, their differences in how they imbue the environment are lifelong and deep-seated. Um, and I know that because Hugh, by the, 19, late, by the 1960s, has largely left plantation um, um, running to either hired managers or later his son, uh, Nicky. Um, and instead, he has become a big game hunter. First in Mississippi, then in Alaska, in South America. Eventually, he goes on repeated safaris, spending the growing seasons in Africa, which is the ideal time to hunt. They add these massive rooms to their house to show, and I'm sorry, these are newspaper clippings and they're not very clear, but to, 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 to create a room for his trophies. He is known as Mississippi's most celebrated hunter during these years. He's written about in the newspapers all the time. And he goes on these safaris with his wife. Um, this is Hugh in the center here. Over on the far right, that is Curl. Um, but in all of these trips that they do together, there's a big difference between Hugh and Curl. Hugh shoots animals. 
Curl takes pictures. Um, and while she sometimes poses with the animals he kills, she just as often is involved in efforts to try and protect species by getting endangered animals into wildlife refuges. Uh -huh. So throughout their life, 57 years of happy marriage that I doubt they ever fought over this issue about, they nonetheless maintain a gendered and different idea of what ecology in the Delta should be and ecology in the world should be. At the end of the day, there's some convergence of those visions. Um, at the end of the day, though, I think the women end up winning. Um, so this is, I had to like scramble through, through briar patches and, um, and down through gullies to get here. But this is the rear most, I'm sorry, the northern western part of the land that those women preserved, um, Pine Crest Cemetery and their, their, their land. And I'm in the midst of those trees they planted. And I'm looking across a gully. Uh, and on the other side of that gully is this, the Morgan Brake National Wildlife Refuge. Um, in the mid-1970s, the federal government comes into Chula. There's land to be purchased. Um, in, the, in the late 50s and early 60s, cotton prices had gone up. Farmers had expanded their holdings into very marginal farmland right along the lowest bluffs on the side of, um, on the edge of Chula. Um, that land turned out not to be very viable for long-term farming. Cotton prices went down. Farmers in the area tried raising pigs without much success. They tried building, as you can see here, um, catfish ponds without a lot of success. Um, and by the mid-1970s, the federal government will step in and purchase that land to create a national wildlife refuge. A national wildlife refuge that at this point here, is right on the edge of Pinecrest Cemetery. Now, as far as I know, and, and if any of you have access to these documents and can help me to find them, because I am having a hard time finding them, the people who created the wildlife refuge had no idea about Pinecrest Cemetery. Um, but they had discovered what the women had discovered 20 years earlier, which was this land is more valuable preserved then turned into farmland. It turns out that these lowest bluffs, bluffs that are created by uh, blowing um, topsoil, um, are some of the finest examples of lowest bluffs in America. Um, it turns out that this land is an excellent home for migrating birds. Um, over a thousand ducks migrate through this, a uh, hundred thousand ducks migrate through this land every year. Um, over 250 species of birds can be found in the Morgan Brake National Wildlife Refuge. It's an incredibly important national wildlife refuge. And who recognized that? This valuable land, this, you know, this, this bluff that needed to be preserved, it was the women of Chula, right? It was the garden club that recognized it long before the men realized they needed to preserve this land and long before the federal government realized they needed to preserve the land. The women's legacy is not Morgan Brick, as far as I can tell. But it's worth remembering what these women were doing. Um, we often think of conservation in terms of men, you know, the Teddy Roosevelt's, um, um, uh, the John Murs, um, who preserved the land. We only think about the women as kind of an afterthought in the 1960s when uh, Rachel Carson publishes um, uh, uh, Silent Spring, and suddenly it becomes a woman's issue. But through the early 20th century, through garden clubs and local organizations, women were involved in conservation, even in the heart of the economic use of land, the Mississippi Delta. Um, and so that's why we need to study cookbooks, because this story has been long lost. The cemetery is there, but nobody remembers who owns the cemetery or where it came from. The only, that little clip from the cookbook that I wasn't able to show you, um, that only that little line in the cookbook um, that says, this was created by the women of Chula reminds us that women were in so many Delta communities and so many Mississippi communities through their charitable works, through charitable cookbooks, participating and creating the communities they lived in. Um, and so that's my story, a story about how cookbooks help us to understand 
part of Mississippi history that's lost if we don't preserve them. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to take any of your questions. Yes, sir. Again, hang on. I'll, oh, let me sorry. hand you the mic so everybody can the mic. hear you. Yes, I forgot. In the beginning, um, you talked about the newly collected archives of all these cookbooks and all. Do you have links or where to go access that? Yeah, the easiest way um, to access this collection is to put in USM or Southern Miss Digital Archives. Um, it'll take you right to their kind of homepage. Um, click on the collections. Um, it is part, at, right now, I'm trying to get it made into a separate collection, but right now it's part of the Mississippiana collection. So click on Mississippiana and scroll down and you'll see cookbooks. Click on cookbooks and you'll get a whole list of, as I said, we're still digitizing some of them. Um, so I, last I checked, it was over 100 um, of these cookbooks, including the Chula cookbook, um, which, is, which, which is available online. So. Yes? Hang on, let me bring you the mic. Oh, yes, I keep forgetting that. Is it possible to physically visit the cookbooks? I mean, to um, see them, absolutely. to hold them? Absolutely. They are, like many archival collections, like the archival collections here, um, you can't just wander in the stacks. Um, but you can go um, and ask for any of these you want to see. Uh, we have cookbooks dating back to the early 20th century. Um, we have some uh, manuscript collections from some uh, journalists who wrote about food in Mississippi. We have some cookbooks that are the kind of handwritten and family cookbooks, right, that are one of the kind um, uh, in the collection. Collection. They're all searchable in the, um, um, in the university's um, library catalog. Um, and the ones that are digitized, you can actually search through much of the text. So if you're looking for the name of a particular per person, you can search for that person and see if they contributed a recipe. Not all of them are, are um, you know, it's a lot of work to transcribe cookbooks, it turns out. Um, they don't digitally transcribed very well. And so not all of them have transcriptions yet, but we're constantly working and improving that, so. Yeah. Actually, I'll ask a question from the live stream. Uh, how much money was raised by this cookbook? Do we know? So no, um, I have talked to, written to the national, um, uh, 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 the, the, sorry, the, um, um, Garden Clubs of America um, to find out if I can get a hold of the original application and it has not been preserved, um, unfortunately. The Garden Club in Chula is now defunct. Um, I've managed to talk to one person who was a member, but nobody knows where the records are. Um, um, so how much money was raised, I don't know. Um, there is an association that continues to own the, the cemetery, um, which had, was, you know, is a kind of legacy funding from the Garden Club. So it was significant over the years. Um, um, this was not prime farmland when they bought it, so I don't think this was expensive land, but planting uh, 18,000 trees can't come cheap. Um, so I think they raised a lot of money, but how much, I don't know. So. I'm fascinated by the way you can slice and dice to learn about cultural things, um, you know, religious preferences, food preferences, all kinds of things. Have you done other slicing and dicing to look at other cultural aspects of our history? Of, of uh, through the cookbooks. Um, yes, I mean, you know, I, I gave you a highlight of some um, in talking about uh, Calhoun City and Laurel, um, but I've looked at a uh, Jackson cookbook that was published by a, um, uh, a it was not the Confederate Daughters, um, but a rival group um, to try and look at how they positions themselves and created a community that was a lot less successful than the community in, in, in Jackson in the long run. I've looked at um, uh, a cookbook in the Northern Delta from, um, from uh, uh, um, Cahoma, um, which has been fascinating to tell two different stories, one about the woman who was involved in it, a woman by the name of Blanche Ralston, um, who was a mover and shaker in the state, a kind of forgotten activist um, who was involved in state politics for many years, went on to work for the Works Progress Administration, was a regional director of the Works Progress Administration, was part of World War II, uh, women's planning for World War II, and then comes back to write this cookbook in kind of 
disappear. And it's helped me to think about what happens to women's politics in the post-World War II era in Mississippi. Um, that cookbook has also allowed me to, to think a lot about race um, in Mississippi. That in a cookbook from, um, um, uh, uh, um, I'm sorry, um, from, um, uh, why am I blanking on the river town just north of, of uh, um, Natchez and... Um, Fort Gibson. What is that? Vicksburg, thank you. Sorry, my brain here. You're, you get on these tracks and, and you lose things. Um, that, that in a cookbook from the 1980s, actually, in Vicksburg, which is one of the earlier um, black-authored community cookbooks that I've been able to look at. Um, by contrasting the two cookbooks, um, I've been able to talk a little bit about the way that uh, black cooks were marginalized, even as black cooking um, in the state really was not. Um, so... Yeah, so there are multiple stories in these cookbooks. Um, I once claimed to a class that you could, I could pick up any one of these cookbooks at random um, and find a story in it. Um, unfortunately, the student took me up on that um, and found this uh, church cookbook from a suburb of Jackson that honestly, I couldn't find a story to tell about it. Um, but most of these stories, once you put them within the community they come from, right? When you understand what the women were trying to do with the cookbook, they tell us about women's lives in particular and community lives in general. And one of the other parts of this story um, that is really the food story, for those of you who came here hoping that I would talk more about food, um, is that what these cookbooks tell us about the way Mississippians ate is that while the, the, the politics were local, the food was not. Um, Mississippians were not the kind of backwater of, of, of food that we might imagine that Mississippi is sometimes portrayed as out of step. Um, and they were, um, Mississippians were really interested in food um, and these cookbooks show it. Um, and they were interested in ethnic food and they were interested um, in immigrant food. They were interested in chop suey and Middle Eastern food. And that is not true just of the Mississippi Delta where there were uh, Chinese and um, um, uh, Arab populations that brought that food. Um, that is true in uh, rural southeastern Mississippi and rural northeastern uh, Mississippi, areas that didn't have many immigrants, um, but people were interested in food and all the variety of foods. And so when they couldn't learn locally, they turned to national magazines and national newspapers to learn new recipes incorporated into their cooking. And so it is uh, remarkable that, you know, as far back as the earliest of these cookbooks, um, we see a kind of fascination with food and the diversity of food for Mississippi. Some of these cookbooks celebrate it. Um, one cookbook that I absolutely love from uh, Macomb um, called The Dinah um, takes the metaphor of a train um, and the train allows you to travel. Um, and so the cookbook says, look, um, a cookbook is like a train. It allows you to travel virtually through all of these different foods and experience this, this wide variety of things you wouldn't have otherwise. So, yeah. I have a couple more questions from the live stream. Uh, one asks is, are there any efforts to restore the cemetery, I guess, the Chula Cemetery? So um, our, our, we do not so much restore it as preserve. Um, so we take what we find um, and we try and keep it as best we can. Um, one of the reasons that the archives are not open access is because these are considered historical documents that need to be preserved. Um, um, we preserve them by digitizing them. That's part of the preservation process. Um, but we're also, you know, we don't want to restore these to pristine condition. One of the most fascinating things about many of these cookbooks is the notes that people wrote. Um, um, it turns out that, you know, I once was at a conference and somebody said, well, nobody ever uses these cookbooks. Um, well, that's not true. Um, when you look at these cookbooks, people have changed the recipes. They made the recipe and they think, well, this needs more sugar. This needs more salt. Or sometimes they've gone back to the person who submitted the recipe and said, I think you made a mistake. It doesn't work. And there's a note saying, you know, Mrs. Smith said she forgot to leave out the, the, the you know, the currants or whatever. I was once giving a talk and a woman in the audience came with little um, uh, uh, cards, recipe cards. And she said, I knew you were talking about this cookbook, 
and I wanted to correct the record. My mother didn't want people making her most precious dessert recipe, um, and so the recipe she put in the cookbook is not accurate. And here's the real recipe. Um, and so people were engaged in a conversation about these recipes. People often wrote in recipes. They often, we, we even preserved clippings, right? If the, if the cookbook is stuffed with newspaper clippings, those clippings are preserved as well. So it's not so much about restoration as it is preservation. So. I have a friend connected with a cookbook that is associated with a uh, restaurant, and she admitted that they didn't give the full and exact uh, recipe each time for their most popular dishes. So that, that is, you know, yeah. recipes are precious intellectual, um, um, uh, uh, intellectual knowledge, value. They have value, right? Uh, some people made their living off these recipes. One of the reasons that I'm not able to talk about black cooking as often as I am about white cooking, is that in the community cookbook collection that we have, the historic collection before 1970, there's not a single black community cookbook. Mm. Now, I've had people say, oh, there are some. But when they go and look for them, they don't exist. Um, and to date, after five or six years of trying to do this and asking around, I have not located, prior to 1970, a uh, black community cookbook. Um, now, I think there's lots of reasons for that, as I pointed out. They're expensive, they were expensive to produce, and black communities may not have had uh, the financial resources. But I also think we have to remember that many members of the black community made their living off cooking. Uh, and giving over their recipes was giving over what made their work valuable, right? It was surrendering their knowledge. Um, and I think some black cooks were reluctant to put down their recipes in written, in, in written form because it would compromise their ability to get jobs. That's speculation. Hard to, hard to prove, um, but um, yes, um, people don't, these were valuable entities. Um, you know, some women, their reputation in the community, their reputation in their church uh, or in the garden club was that they were great cooks and giving up those recipes was giving up a little bit of, them, of themselves. So. Thank you all for coming here today. Um, I hope that we will see you next week for Candace Taylor and then don't forget the gallery talk on Thursday. Um, Today, help me thank Andrew Haley for this fabulous presentation.